Good morning. Good morning. So glad to see everybody this morning. We're glad you're with us. And whether you're out here with us in person or online with us, we're grateful that the Lord has brought us all together. So today we're going to talk about our mission. What are we all about uh, as a church locally, but also globally? And it's what Martin Luther, as we celebrate the Reformation today, um, what Martin Luther reminded the church, what the church is meant to be all about. And so we'll talk about that in a minute. But be reminded of what Psalm, or excuse me, yeah, Psalm 29 says, ascribe, it says, Psalm 29 says, ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. And it goes on, ascribe to the Lord this and ascribe to the Lord that. And essentially, Psalm 29 is inviting us to worship. Worship the Lord who loves us and who reigns with us. So please stand as we worship.
Almighty God, gracious Lord, we thank you that your Holy Spirit renews the church in every age. Pour out your Holy Spirit on your faithful people. Keep them steadfast in your word. Protect and comfort them in times of trial. Defend them against all enemies of the gospel. And bestow on the church your saving peace. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. You may be seated. We invite all the children up for a children's sermon. Yay! Come on over. I'll just hit my ankle over here. Yeah, that's not good. We gotta make more room. Make more room. 
Scooch you in, guys. Scooch you in a little bit so that people behind you can get in. All right, all right, all right. Good morning to each and every one of you. It's good to see you. So what do you think, what do you think the church is all about? What do you think? What do we do? Yeah, yeah? What do you think? <laughs> we sing. That's one thing we do, yeah. Learn about Jesus, okay? Worship God. Worship God. Preach. We preach. Well, one of us preaches. A couple of us <laughs> preaches. Two of us <laughs> preach. Sometimes more. But yeah, definitely, that happens. What else? What do we, what do, we do around here? Yeah? Uh, Think about it. Think about it. Sing about Jesus. Sing about Jesus. We do that. Yep. Pray. We pray. So we do a lot of things. We sing, we pray, we learn about Jesus, we pray to Jesus, we sing about Jesus, we preach, uh, we do acts of kindness, right? We share food with people that need some food. Uh, sometimes the church, this church and other churches, sometimes do acts of justice on behalf of those who need help in that way. There's a lot of things we do. But you know what the primary, the absolute number one thing we do ever is we connect people to Jesus. So God wants to people have people connected to Jesus. And that's what that's our primary thing. So some of that happens when you were baptized, you got connected to Jesus. Jesus connected God connected you to Jesus in your baptism. And then every day of your life, even Sunday morning when you come here, every day you get connected to Jesus. So Jesus is everything we do. He is the center of everything. Does that mean that, does that, mean that we agree about everything? Yeah. Do you think so? <laughs> Somebody said yes. Who says yes? We, well, no, I don't think we agree about it. Some people said no. I would say no, I don't think we agree about everything. Like, there's some people who are Bengals fans. I don't know why they're Bengals fans. I don't agree with that. Some people are Browns fans. I agree with that. Some people have this opinion or that opinion, but those opinions about things, whether they like that school or that another school, or they go to that school, yeah. What if they like both? That's a unicorn if they like both. But that's possible. It is possible that you like both. But here's the thing. Jesus is the reason why we gather. He's the reason that for our personal lives as well as our life together. And then our mission, you and I, we then tell others about Jesus so that they can get connected to Jesus because he's the one who gives us life. He loves us and gives us people to be friends even when we disagree. Amen? Okay. Will you close your hands? Full, uh, close your hands, close your eyes, and pray with me. Dear God, thank you for these young disciples, and we pray that as they are connected to you, that, Lord Jesus, you would be, speak life and truth and hope and meaning and connect them with other people in grace-filled friendships. All these things we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Thank you for coming up. So I am the reader today. So just a reminder, if you want to be part of, of what happens on Sunday morning uh, and read the gospel or share uh, in the sacrament by distributing the elements uh, in many various ways, even being part of the worship team, we certainly welcome you to be part of that. It's, it's part of our sharing our life together to do these things. So this morning we have two readings from Scripture, and the first is from Romans chapter 3. And Romans chapter 3 says this. It begins with verse 19, if I'm correct about that. 19 through 28. 
The Apostle Paul, writing to the Christians in Rome, says, Now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be silenced and the whole world be held accountable to God. Therefore, no one will be declared righteous in God's sight by the works of the law. Rather, through the law, we become conscious of our sin. But now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been made known to which the law and the prophets testify. This righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference between Jew and Gentile, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and all are justified freely by His grace through the redemption that came by Jesus Christ. God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of His blood to be received by faith. He did this to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance, he left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. He did it to demonstrate his righteousness at the present time so as to be just and the one who justifies those who have faith in in Jesus. Where there is boasting, it is excluded because of that, of what law? The law that requires works? No, because of the law that requires faith. For we maintain that a person is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. And a reading from John's Gospel, chapter 8. It says, To the Jews who believed in him, Jesus said, If you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. They answered him, We are Abraham's descendants. They have never been slaves of anyone. How can you say that we shall be set free? Jesus replied, Very truly I tell you, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. Now a slave has no permanent place in the family, but a son belongs to it forever. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. Now, I have to walk over here and grab this easel and a piece of paper. Don't leave. Okay. (laughs) Give me a second. Pause in the service for a moment. This pastor Mike gets his stuff. Okay. So, we're going to get to this in a moment. Um, I'm going to make it so everybody, hopefully everybody can see, whether you're on the sides or online with us or even in the back row, but we'll get there. Okay, we're going to get to this in a second. Not a second, but let me just say this. So, do you know who, or, you know who Orlando Deshaun Harris is? Do you know who that person is? Orlando Deshaun Harris uh, was a lonely 19-year-old young man. And on Monday, Orlando took an, a gun into a high school in St. Louis and killed a teacher and, another, and a student. He was a graduate of the high school. And there's no excuse for the evil and the havoc and the chaos that was created. And we pray for those who are affected, whether it be physically affected, the families of those they lost loved ones, and those who are emotionally wounded by the terror that happened in that school. But what's even, what's also tragic is the note that the police officers found in Orlando's car that day. And it was in the news, I don't know if you heard what the note said. Um, The note that Orlando left, because he also passed away, uh, this note they found in his car, it says this. I don't have any friends. I don't have any family. I never had a girlfriend. I never had a social life. I've been isolated, but I've been an isolated loner my entire life. This is a young man in deep pain. It doesn't excuse his behavior because his behavior is reprehensible. And in awful. But we, he gave us a picture of what's going on in his life in that moment. 
And be, out of that deep pain of loneliness, I have experienced, have you ever been lonely? It's one of the worst human pains I think a person can experience. It's a, it's a pain that's hard to get out of. Because the phone, people will say, just call me. But the phone feels like a thousand pound weight. I can't even move my fingers to call somebody because I'm so racked with loneliness. And I start believing that nobody really cares. And then the, the perpetual lies begin to happen. And we get even more lonely. And then we begin to make choices out of that loneliness. And this was, for this young man, a violent choice that wreaked havoc. Because he said at the end of that, after all these, I never had a girlfriend, never had a social life. I don't have any friends. I don't have a family. I'm an isolated loner. This was the perfect storm for a mass shooter. Awful. Loneliness is a pervasive difficulty that human beings have faced across the centuries since the beginning of time. And it's something that the church can help end in somebody's life. Because when we are part of a congregation in a vibrant way, we're connected to the God who loves us and thereby connected to his people, we find life belonging. Somebody knows our name. They see our face. They may not oh, know everything about us, but they, we know there's a deeper connection happening. Isabella, one of our persons on our staff who's our communications director, and our, on her Facebook, she put out, she told us um, a few weeks ago, a, an informal survey to the people that follow her. And like, she has like 700 people responded to this survey. And it was basically the question, what do you look for in a church? And a lot of people who answered that survey on her list are not part of a church. And she said, you know what the number one thing people said? Number one, community, friendships, connection. Because there's a craving in every single human being for this friendship, this connection, this deeper belonging. And the church has a, has a mission to share in that regard. I don't know. I'm one person that lives in this world just like you. I'm not an expert in sociology or that, but it feels like, it feels like that this epidemic of loneliness is growing. People feel even more isolated sometimes. And I, my hope would be the church can begin to move in that direction to connect people to Christ. What is, what is our primary mission? It's in one sentence of St. Luke Lutheran Church. What is it? You know? Connect people to a growing relationship with Jesus Christ. That is it. That is the primary thing we do. I've been around the church long enough, and you have as well, and I've been to a bunch of churches as a pastor in other places, and I've talked to enough pastors, and, and you have as well. This is not, no, not new news. But unfortunately, churches can kind of go, well, our mission is to keep the doors open. Our mission is to have a great building. Our mission is, is to perpetuate traditions. Our mission is X, Y, Z. Those are all secondary things. The building serves the bigger mission. The music serves a bigger mission. It's not about all those things. It's about this connecting people to a growing relationship with Jesus Christ because you and I know that when we're connected to Christ in a growing way and then we get connected to his people, that loneliness begins to dissipate because something deeper is happening. Our soul is being satisfied. So this mission that we're on to connect people to a growing relationship with Jesus Christ is about certainly the truth of the gospel that Jesus crucified and risen. Absolutely it's about that. And on a more human level is saying that matters to our souls. God forgives us and connects us. Isn't that beautiful what God does in a grace-filled way? So when I was in college, I went to the University of Cincinnati my freshman year, then I transferred to Miami University. My freshman year, I was a lonely college student. That's where a lot of my loneliness I experienced when I was 19 years old. I was a lonely young man. 
I had some friends, but I didn't have any deep friendships. Until the spring of that year, I went to a Lutheran campus ministry that just was outside my dorm, just right down the street. I met at a YMCA on a Sunday morning, maybe 11 o'clock in the morning. And one Sunday morning in April, I said, I need to go find some people. I grew up in the church. I hadn't been gone to church for a long time, but I knew there was a group of people that met in a, that there were Christians that met in that building. I'm like, fine, I'll go. And so that changed my life. And then I went to one at Miami. I, my, some of my friends that I met there were part of a group called InterVarsity Christian Fellowship. It's a parachurch organization, a, an organization that works on campuses around the United States, and I think it also in Canada. And InterVarsity's mission is to connect college students in particular to the gospel of Jesus Christ and to introduce them to this living Jesus who, who loves them. And so when I was at Miami, my fresh, my sophomore year, uh, in that fall of that year, I met Jesus. I had not met him before. And all of a sudden, InterVarsity introduced me to this Jesus who lives, who loves me, who wants to be connected to me. And thereby then I got part of a small group. And I got to talking with people and I didn't feel as lonely anymore because all of a sudden God put me in his, his, with his people. And I was like, it, it completely re reformed my life, revolutionized it. And I wasn't even going to be a pastor then. I was just like, I was just kind of minding my business as a student and I was a Christian. InterVarsity has a way of explaining the gospel, which I'm going to show to you. It's called a circle of belonging. And I'm going to connect this circle of belonging with what Martin Luther did in 1517, which we remember the day of Reformation. It's a way for us as the church to connect people to Christ in a growing relationship and then be connected to his people. Okay? Here's the deal. I hope you can see it. I apologize if you... I, okay. Here's the deal. So we make it... We can make it make four squares on a piece of paper, and we have a big circle here. And this is how we explain it. So in the beginning... God created all things. God was in the center of all things. God was all things. And the human beings related to God and related to each other and the creation around it, and it all worked. God designed people to belong to one another and to God. It was perfect. It worked as God in the center and you remember what, what God said about human beings? One of the first things he said, it's not good for a man to be alone, right? Even in the early creation, there's a, uh, he's reckon, God's recognizing there's a need for belonging. Not good for you to be alone. It's not good. And yet, unfortunately, uh, human, as, history, as, as time moved on, human beings began to choose other things to put in the center of their lives instead of God. Taking God out of the center and putting things like money at the center. Addiction at the center. It could be, we can be addicted to anything. Uh, we put ourselves sometimes at the center of our being. Sometimes we put sports or a sports team like the Browns or the Bengals or the Ohio State Buckeyes. And we, our lives begin to revolve around ourselves, around our addiction, around our money, around a sports team, around our possessions maybe. We think that's it. If I just get that, I will fill this need for something. But you and I both know I can go to Ohio State game or a Blue Jackets game or a Browns game for that matter and feel a sense of community, but I can be completely lonely. Because why well, might high five the guy next to me who I've never met because the Browns scored one touchdown that he won't score anymore doesn't mean I'm in community with them. They don't know me. I don't know them. We're going to leave after that game. We just, we just paid a lot of money for a, to watch a game. And all these things for a while satisfy, but they can never satisfy the longing for belonging, this craving that we are looking for. But when we substitute God, other things for God in the center of being, you know what the Bible calls it? The Bible calls it sin. So I read in Romans chapter 3, there's a verse in Romans chapter 3, verse, 30, verse 23, Paul says to the church in Rome, he says, the wages, you know, he says that in verse chapter 6. Chapter 6, 
Back up. 3, 23, Paul says, all sin and have fallen short of the glory of God, right? All sin. Every human being on this planet from the very, have sinned. All sin and fall short of the glory of God. And then, then in chapter 6, verse 23, it says the wages of sin. What's the wages of sin? Yeah. Death, right? And, and Paul is not messing around. And this, this Romans text that we read today, that book of Romans is at the heart of the Reformation of the church that Luther brought the church back to. It's at the heart of it. So it's saying all sin and the wages of sin is death. So here's the thing. So then we go, okay, well, that's not good. Nobody likes this. Nobody likes death. So what's the solution? What's the solution here? I got it. How about the solution is we just be good enough? Because we can get out of that death thing. If we're just, if we just do enough good things, we're enough good people, we pay enough money, then we're fine, right? That's what the church thought. That's what the church was promoting in Luther's day. Hey, if you're just good enough, maybe your, people, maybe your ancestors who died before you and they're in purgatory, if you just pay enough money to build the basilica in Rome, they'll get out of purgatory. Because John Tetzel, who Luther was around, and John Tetzel was the ambassador for the Catholic Church in that day, John Tetzel said he'd go around to, to, to villages and say, when a coin in the coffer clings, another soul from purgatory springs. Brilliant. <laughs> and the church's mission then became, let's build a big building in Rome and use all the money of the people in Germany and Italy and all the Roman Catholic world in that day and we'll perpetuate this idea that if you're just good enough, pay enough money, and do enough good works, then God has to accept you because God says, we all know what God says, be good boys and girls and therefore then you'll earn my love. Right? No. no. That's not what the Bible says at all. That's not what the gospel, that's not what Jesus would say. So Luther was hearing this, and he's like, this is all, we're misunderstanding this. This adventures in misunderstanding. Let's get back to what is the scripture say? What does Romans say to us? What does the entire breadth of scripture say? That God's love is unconditional. God's love is for us, not against us. We can't be good enough, and God doesn't say, because you're bad, you're out. Because you're good, you're in. We're all bad. We've all sinned and fall short. We all, des- we all, the wages of sin is death for all of us. But what does God do? God says, I know you can't get out of it. This dilemma. So let me take it on myself. Let me, let me have Jesus come. And so Jesus comes and he takes on this death that we deserve on the cross. He takes it all on to himself. So that we don't have to experience that on our own. For uh, We won't experience it at all. And Romans chapter 3, uh, verse 24, so we just read for 23, and then verse 24, Paul goes on. Exactly this. Romans chapter 3, verse 24. Hold on. Don't leave. Let me get to it. Give me a second here. Romans. It is right here. I keep passing it. All right. Here it is. Verse 24. Romans 23 says, All sin and fall short of the glory of God, and all are justified freely by his grace. Freely. You don't have to do anything. You don't have to be anybody. No matter who you are, freely, by his grace. Through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his blood to be received by faith. He did this to demonstrate his righteousness and so on. So then, what happens is, God goes, okay, Jesus is in the center. And then when Jesus is in the center of our, of our existence, our lives, every single day, and we just live in Jesus and receive the gift that God gives us, 
Jesus said, Seek first the kingdom of God, and all these things will be added unto you. And what are these things? We might say, these things are identity. Paul says in Romans, we are sons and daughters of the Most High God. We are made, we, that is our core being. We are beloved children of God. We have an identity. We have a, we have a purpose now. We live with Christ who equips us for good works to do in the world. Whatever that looks like, we have our own unique purposes in Christ that Christ gives us to make a difference, to bear Christ, God's grace, justice, and peace and mercy to the world. We have purpose now. We have, um, we have what, what Christ says. We have freedom And that was in the gospel today, that Christ sets us free. And then Paul says this, it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Freedom. And God's not going to take away our freedom. God's going to give us freedom. And then lastly, and most important, not most importantly, but lastly, Christ gives us belonging. We belong to Christ and to another, the scriptures tell us. We belong to him and to one another. We get connected to a bigger movement. We get connected to his people and we start to be known and seen and, and we grow together. This is the reformation of the church right here. This is our mission, this circle of belonging, to connect people like Orlando before he wreaks havoc on situations like that, to connect our neighbor who never comes out of, or rarely comes out of their house, to connect our coworker who comes and goes and we don't ever talk to them. To connect people in a, in a place where they feel like somebody knows me, loves me. And as that happens, then we have, then the doors open for us to share this with them. Oh, wait, I love you, but there's a God who loves you even more, who's come for you, who died for you, who desperately wants to be connected to you And so the the response then is this. We admit, yep, we have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We accept accept Christ's forgiveness on the cross and the crucifixion that he did for us. And then we ask for Christ to come into our life and we commit ourselves to this one and we get connected to his people in meaningful and deeper ways. Admit, accept, ask, and then we're com- we commit and get connected. You can take this, you can do this on a piece of paper with your friend or with your kids or with your family members. You can do the exact same thing. It's just a way of ex- one way to explain the gospel. The Reformation is a big historical movement, but even for Luther, if he was here today, he would say, look, the Reformation starts in each of our hearts. It starts when God reforms us from the inside out. And then the church begins to reform from, out, from that way. So I don't know where anybody else is here today. And maybe, maybe for you, never, you never heard this. Maybe today is a day to ask Jesus to be the center of your life. Say, I've never done that. Maybe for, us, for some of us, it's let me recommit myself to that because maybe I've lost my way. Whatever it is, let's pray. Lord Jesus, come. Be among us as you are among us. I ask that Holy Spirit, you would draw us to you reestablish the center, the design that you established in the very beginning, that you desire a relationship with us and therefore you give us relationship with others. We ask that you come into our lives, forgive us our sins, renew and lead us in paths of righteousness for your name's sake. Thank you. We pray this in your name. Amen. Excuse me.
Please stand. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks, broke it and gave it to his disciples saying, take and eat, this is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. And again, after supper, he took the cup, he gave thanks and gave it for all to drink saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. United as one by the Holy Spirit, we pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Jesus welcomes sinners and eats with them. Come, take your place at the table. You may be seated.
the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. In gratitude and humility, let us join together in prayer on behalf of all of God's creation. God, our fortress, we pray for the church. Write your law of love on the hearts of your people that we remain steadfast in our witness to your grace. God, our liberator, we pray for your earth. Bring new life to overused land, reform and reorient our relationship with the environment that we may faithfully care for all of your creation. God, our refuge and strength, we pray for the nations where they are in an uproar, bring wise leadership and comfort for those in distress. Make wars to cease and peace to enter every land. God, our very present help in trouble, we pray for those in need. Show mercy to refugees and all fleeing from danger. Shelter any without homes. Calm all who are facing illness or surgery, especially Allie, Annie Buss, Belinda Desario, Jan Dixon, Jean Donahue, Bo Gagan, Ron Gusatelli, Bill Hall, Brian Heil, John Heilman, Mike Hernandez, Nancy Himmer, Jerry Humphrey, Bev Kirkbride, Denise Lawson, Bob Mayle, Paul Knoll, Tom Radke, Chris Reese, Annabella Romain, Nancy Scherfe, Ken Smith, Gwen Stevens, Mark Tanner, Jeff Trailer, Fiona Wagner, and Aaron and Rachel Waltman. God, our Redeemer, we play for our congregation. Bless all who are preparing for baptism or affirmation of baptism. Open their hearts to your Holy Spirit. Teach them your word and give them courage to proclaim their faith. God, our stronghold, we give thanks for those who have gone before us in faith, especially Martin Luther and all reformers. Renew and reform us as we strive to continue in your word. With grateful hearts, we commend our spoken and silent prayers to you, O God, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. You may be seated for a few announcements. Um, maybe you heard we had a fall festival last week, um, and it was wonderful if, if you were here, um, and especially if you helped, if you um, brought yourself, if you brought your neighbors, if you provided candy, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. It was great fun, um, and um, mark your calendars for next year, because I think, you know, we're going to, it's the first annual fall festival. Um, so we have to have a second one so for it to be the first annual. Um, starting next week, I will be uh, doing my study group and discussion on what makes for meaningful worship. I hope maybe you can fit it in um, around this worship time because we're going to be meeting at 930 in the sanctuary. But I look forward to input from um, all sides. Um, we, our parent group here at St. Luke is ongoing. Um, Sundays at 11. Um, there is child care for um, younger kids, um, and it is a week-to-week -week thing, so if you can't come one week, do feel free to drop in the next week. Um, there's no, there's no long-going uh, story arc there. Um, there are uh, thankful bags for Lutheran Social Services. Um, they're already piling up. I think there might be a few left on the Welcome Center. I kind of didn't look as I came past. Um, but there were a few left um, in the uh, Sanctuary Welcome Center. And um, get those, fill them up, bring them back next week, and help um, provide the elements of a Thanksgiving dinner for folks in need around Central Ohio area. And um, do check out your bulletin for details about the unbelievable, super fantastic, truly amazing Christmas extravaganza 
which is the um, you know, rather modest name of the children's uh, musical for Christmas that um, we'll begin rehearsing uh, next week. So um, if you have kids in that uh, middle or elementary school age group, pre-K to fifth, yes, um, get them signed up and get them rehearsing so that we can get into the Christmas spirit. And Mike has an announcement that he wants to share specifically. Okay, so after worship, here we create sometimes an awkward moment. We don't want to. Is that see, the reality is this? We have to. This room is used by preschool throughout the week, right? So all the chairs have to come down. So over the years, we've kind of wondered when do we put the chairs down? We want to interrupt people because we love that everybody has conversations and connects with people. By the way, if you don't know somebody, go after this worship, go talk to them, get to know them. But so, but we still need to take the chairs down. So uh, our staff was talking about this week, and then I talked to Carrie about it, and we thought, here's the deal. How about we do this? If you can help us put down the chairs after worship and the tables, we would really appreciate it because we have to have this room cleared by Monday morning. If you want to have a conversation and connect with people, fantastic. That's awesome. We don't want to be in your way. So if you want to have, there's plenty of space back there for conversation or other, other things, but if people want to stick around right after worship and take down the chairs, that's really, really helpful, okay? So it's kind of creates kind of an awkward time after worship, and we know that, but we just got to get done. But we want you to be connected as well. Does that make sense? Yeah, it's kind of weird. Okay, that's it. That, so after worship, if you can help with chairs, fantastic. If you want to have a conversation, awesome too. Good. Okay. All right. We are all about the weirdness. Yeah. All right. So um, please stand to receive the benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord's face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Let's sing our final song. tries to roll over my bones when sorrow comes to steal the joy I own when brokenness and pain is all I know oh I won't be shaken no I won't be shaken my fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. She knows.
Amen. Go in peace and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. My fear.